Every second is just another chance to glow. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. If you're joining us online, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We are kicking off a brand new series entitled Glow, where the darkness meets the light. We're going to be looking at some very sobering things, and before we look at those things, I want to preface, especially if, if you're not familiar with the ministry of Rockfish Church and you're new to Rockfish Church, I want, I want to say this on the front end so that you'll catch this. The things that I'm going to share and the zealous approach that I may take in sharing these things, my heart is that you understand it comes from a heart of love and compassion, okay? Uh, I'm not angry. I don't want to come across as angry, but very often when God speaks, he speaks through us. And we're human, and we have personalities, and we have passions, and we have all of those things that, that can kind of bubble up. And I, I want for you today to see the urgency and the love of God, not, not just me. So that's my prayer, that God would allow you to hear what he would say to you and to his church today. I'm going to be talking today and throughout the totality of this, of this series about the church and its effect and effectiveness concerning the world. Today, I want to talk to you very candidly about where we are culturally, where we are as the church. And when I say church, I'll try to distinguish as we go between the capital C church and the small church. But where we are culturally, where we are as the church, where I believe that we are headed, and I, I think it'll be very obvious, I want to discuss with you briefly who our enemy is, who our enemy is not. And last but not least, and I believe this is probably the most important aspect, is the role and the responsibility of the church in the day and hour in which we, in which we live. So our, our verse for this series, or the inspiration, or the genesis for this comes from Matthew 5, 14, and 16. It says something very profound. I'm going to begin with this verse, and I'm going to end with this verse. And it's probably going to sound very, very different at the culmination of this message than it does right now. You, and this is Christ speaking to his disciples. Remember Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Well, here he says something a little different. And profound, he said, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and they give it light, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. In heaven, two very important things I believe that we must understand. One, you and I were created to glorify God. Well, what does that mean? It means that as 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 the moon reflects the, the light of the sun and, and glorifies or transitions that glory onto humanity at night, we are called to glorify or trans transition his glory through us into this world. You are the light of the world. He also said that you were created to illuminate this dark world with the light of heaven. It's very interesting. He said, when you go, he gave them a very simple message. Go saying the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. When we go, we are to bring light. And the full context of the, of the actual uh, verse here says that we're also salt. Salt purifies one, and that's very, it's, it's very important. It purifies, and it also sustains, it preserves. So we're called to be salt, and here it says that we're supposed to be light, and we're supposed to be doing something very intentionally, not setting it aside or being lit for the sake of being lit. It says there's a purpose, there's a reason that you set something on fire as far as illumination. So he gives us very clearly the reality that we are here for a purpose. Urgency and the urgency of our hour and our current position is what I chose to start this message because, or this series, because if we don't get this, 
I believe that the rest of this will be absolutely lost. I believe that the hour is later than we think for America and for the church in America. I believe it's much later, in fact, than what we think. Not only do I believe that we're headed in the wrong direction, I also believe that we have arrived at that destination. I am no longer talking about where we are going. I'm no longer talking about where we are headed. I'm going to talk today about where we are. Guys, we are in the arena and we are surrounded by lions. You understand? And we walk around oblivious to it very often in our, in our house code, and our coffee. I believe the hour is much later. We at large, and I'm speaking of the capital C church, are preoccupied, we're fragmented and divided over foolish things, we're distracted, and most deadly of all, I believe we're apathetic. What does that mean? It means I think that we're kind of not really concerned about the reality. I believe there is a very serious lack of urgency in the capital C church. You say, well, Pastor Tony, I feel very passionate. I feel very urgent. Praise God. I hope, I hope so. I think we all need that. But I think as a whole, there is a dangerous apathy that has settled over the church. I believe that we are far beyond the need to merely recognize our position recognition without action is no longer an option. I believe that with all my heart. And you can, you can write me off. You can say, hey, Pastor Tony, you're crazy. I think you're missing it. Fine. But I think it's not enough for us to recognize it any longer. I believe that recognition without action is no longer an option if we're going to see change in this nation or even in the church. My primary concern is the church. You're going to see why here in just a few moments. I believe it's impossible for me to overemphasize the urgency that this hour in America demands. I think it's important that we have to begin by defining where we are. You understand how difficult it is to get somewhere when you don't really know exactly where you are. I, I talked recently, and I talked about walking into a mall and having the big sign and all of the maps, but if it doesn't have the little red dot that says you are here, it really doesn't do you a whole lot of good. So I want to talk about where we are and two aspects of where we are. First aspect is where are we culturally? I believe that America is, is at large a pagan country at this point. And you may say, well, I don't agree. Well, you don't understand what paganism is. When I begin to give you the attributes of what paganism is, I think you'll really agree with me, or at least you'll understand. Guys, we, we need an urgency. This nation was founded on biblical principles. I don't care what modern historians tell you or anybody else. This nation was founded on biblical principles, not religious principle, principles apart from the Bible, but biblical principles. When you look at our Constitution and look at those things, it, it screams of its origin being from within the context of the Bible. And you can agree or not agree, but let me tell you what we're not anymore. We're no longer dealing with Jews, people who have a relationship with the Bible or a reference point of the Bible. Our culture, culture by large, is removed from any biblical influence. My generation failed in seeking God, and the, and, and the ensuing generations that we're, we're growing up and encountering now have, have been brought up without a reference point of the Bible. If you defrauded your children of that reference point and you're coming to Christ later on in life, you, you need to have urgency about establishing that. If you have an opportunity to establish this reference point in your child's life now, you must do so with urgency and intentionality. Pagans believe that there are many, many gods. And if we do one thing well in America is we turn everything into a god, whether it's a sporting event or whether it's money or whether it's illicit relationships or any relationship, whether it's, it's finances or status or whatever. Many false gods. How about this? Paganism puts an emphasis on the earth and on nature as expressions of deity. Listen to me. This earth is not God. That tree is not God. That's paganism. It is a reflection of the creative power of God, but the tree is not God. The earth is not God. Environmental activism is, is a necessity of expressing your pagan beliefs. Do you understand that? 
We have Earth Day. First of all, for you people who are concerned about the environment, let me, let me help you. Christians should be the absolute best stewards of our environment. I clean up your mess. I walk behind you and I pick up this place and, I, and, and we clean roadsides and we should take care of the environment. But let me explain something to you very carefully. This is going to burn. This is temporary. You want to you talk about global warming? It, it's going to get hot. Every atom and every element is going to melt with a fervent heat. We know this is the destiny. We don't put our hope in this earth, but the creator and the sustainer of this earth. The same one who can bring destruction can also bring healing. But we don't ever get confused between the creator and the creation. And paganism, because of its rejection of God, finds itself in a position to only worship the creation. This is outlined very clearly in the book of Romans, and we're seeing it. Paganism and humanism. Humanism stresses the importance of human values and human dignity. It proposes that people can resolve all problems through science and through reason. Humanism asserts that there is nothing beyond the material. Do you see the problem with this? Sounds good. We should have great human relations, but we can't fix these problems. Can I give you a newsflash? Humans are most of the problem. Humanism leads to something called nihilism, which is rampant in our culture. Nihilism is the rejection of all religions and all moral principles and the belief that life is meaningless and hopeless. And do you understand that's exactly what you get when you embrace atheism and materialism? It ultimately leads to nihilism. What does that mean? It means there's no hope, there's no purpose, there's no meaning. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Keep in mind our courts made it illegal to teach any other view than materialism, naturalism, and humanism in our schools. And it has so affected our children and the ensuing generation since it was allowed that I believe we've reached, we're, we're beyond the point of no return. There is no return. There has to be a rebirth. All of these things lead to nihilism, which is hopelessness and helplessness. Keep in mind, again, our courts made any alternative teaching illegal. Not because the people wanted it. That was a ruling. They eradicated the very influence of the Bible, and we got what we asked for. Ethics 101 in your college and your, your, your college-level courses teaches the first day you walk in, kill God. You see, you have students in school where you went through and you took an ethics course. The question was this, can morality exist without God is the question. Yes, it can, it can exist. Will it function when it's not in alignment with the morality as presented in the Bible? No. You say, well, how can you say that? I not only can say that, I can prove it empirically, and I intend to do just that. When you remove God and you try to retain some semblance of morality in your culture, and in America you're a fool, there is no ref reference point whatsoever. They say to our students, kill God. Understand that morality can exist. You can have your morality, and I can have my morality, and we can all get along. Yeah, right. Well, that means that, that, that the killing a baby is equivalent to saving a dog. Why? What's the point? If there's no God, there's no good. If there's no God, there's no real evil except that which is defined by, by independent morality. What kind of foolishness is this? Killing God was not the escape to reason that it was originally billed to be. It was, in fact, an escape from reason. We have lost our minds, destroying all reference points of reality and morality, leaving man adrift on a sea of purposelessness, hopelessness, subjectivity, a world where our opinion is our God and our feelings are our moral guides. And you see where it is leading us, and excuse me, where it has led us. And I'm not talking about just in the world. I'm not in the church. If it feels good, do it. It's not what I would do, but they should be okay to do that. I don't want to get over and I don't want to impede their rights, even if their rights are, are spilling over to the destruction of somebody else's life. Are we crazy? Placing our culture in the position of dependence upon baseless moral pleas like be kind 
and, and have random acts of kindness to avert social chaos. That's a byproduct of having lives with no intrinsic value. That's exactly what it is. Why should I do good? Random acts of kindness, why? Well, why not random acts of shooting people? If there's no God, you expect me to be good because it's just something that I should do within myself? How is it working? It's not. Why? Because the problems and the evils that we face in America aren't external. They're internal. They're internal. It's not something that's coming upon us from the outside. It's something that is welling up and overflowing from our insides. How is it affected? How are these things, these ways of thinking, how are they affecting? See, see people, it's not that, this, that people think different about things. It's the way people think has been changed. There used to be right and wrong, black and white. But now there's no antithesis. Now it's just, it must be true if it's gray. If it's a culmination of this and this and we put it together and we come to some some synthesis of cooperation. No. So we're not just talking about a generation who, who has different thoughts. We're talking about a generation that thinks differently as a result of the education that they've received. Biblical Marriage and family have been under a relentless attack in America because of this subjective morality. Of course, we want to redefine things. What are the results? We've redefined marriage and what constitutes a family. This is the the results. I'm going to share some statistics here that are just absolutely going to blow your mind. This is what happens when we say we want morality and we we want order, but we don't want God. This is what happens. Okay, one, we've redefined marriage. That has never happened in the history of humanity. 6,000 years of human history, we've never redefined marriage until your generation and my generation. And it happened, its genesis was right here in America. Congratulations. We will be known as the gateway for immorality and, and, the, and the trashing of God's design for human relationship in the form of marriage. Rampant. Sexual immorality, another result. Listen to this. 74% of women engage in sexual behavior before, before marriage. You say, well, why are you picking on women? Because if only 70% of the women engaged before marriage, what do you think the men were? It had 110% on here, if I could fit it. You understand, there's, there's repercussions. Listen to this. 110 million people in America, one-third of the population, because of subjective morality, have STDs. The 300 million people in America, right? Somewhere around there. 110. How about this one? 60 million dead babies because of subjective godless morality that we've been told will work. It hasn't worked in any nation that's ever existed. It will not work in this nation. And it has brought us to the brink of ruin. NBC News reported, listen to this, and listen very carefully to these statistics. The percentage of U.S. adults who identified as something other than heterosexual has doubled over the last 10 years from 3.5% in 2012 when the White House was draped in rainbow flag to 7.1% according to a Gallup poll. Listen to this. With the greatest coming in the youngest generation, listen to this, 2% of baby boomers identified as something other than heterosexual. You say, why are you picking on homosexuals? I'm just telling you this is the fruit. If you're a homosexual, listen, and you struggle with that, there's grace, there's mercy for you, repent. People say, how do you deal with homosexuality at your church? Just like I do any other sin. It's not special. Fornication is not special. It's a sin. We repent of it. We turn from it and we stop it. I'm not going to treat any sin like it's special. Afraid that my culture, and that's why we won't talk about it. Because we're afraid our culture is going to rise up and and cancel us. You can't cancel the church. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against it. And you are that standard. You and you and you. And if you're not that standard, there is no other standard. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. 
2% of baby boomers identified. The latest generation, Generation Z, guess what percentage identifies something other than heterosexual? 24%. Did you hear that? In less than 40 years, that's not a 10% increase. That's not a 100% increase. That's a 2,400. Why? Has something changed? Yes, we've been indoctrinating our children. We have dropped the ball. We've not raised them according to biblical principles. The church has failed. And we can point in the world all we want, but it has nothing to do with them. They are lost and darkened and blinded. They are, they're just doing what is natural. I didn't say what's normal. But we've been quiet to our shame and to the detriment of this nation and the future generations. I'm not talking about where we're going. This is where we are. Listen to this. 2020 survey found that 39.6% of births in the United States are out of wedlock. Listen, US, the United States leads, the single, leads in single-parent homes by 23%. That's almost one-quarter of American households are single-parent households. You say, well, Pastor Tony, what difference does that make? 64% of African-American households are single-parent households. You say, well, why, what difference does that make? Can I tell you what difference that makes? Listen to this. I'm not singling out anybody. I'm just sharing the truth. Listen to this. Professor William Galston, in an empirical study, has pointed out that you need only three things to avoid poverty in this country. Finish high school, marry before having children, and have children after the age of 20. Only 8% of children from these families who do these three things are poor. 79% of those who fail to do these live in poverty. That is a very natural expression. Guys, here, here's some things that you should know. The U.S. poverty rate mirrors the single-parent home statistic. I'm, I'm making a point here. Stay with me. Three in five poor children in the United States, 60%, lived in families headed by unwedded, unwed mothers. The lowest poverty rate is 5% for families headed by a married couple. And race made no difference. Economic status made no difference. Education made no difference. All of it was contingent upon whether they were raised in God's form of a family or not. You say, well, I don't have a husband. The church will be your husband until God sends you another one. Unless you're lucky and he doesn't send you one. But, but that's why you need the church. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. There's good men out there, ladies. And men, there might be a good lady out there. That, that's a biblical reference. Don't get mad at me. L listen to this. Here's some of the well-known risks of children growing up in single-parent homes. Are you ready? Lower school achievement. More discipline problems, school suspensions, less high school graduation, lower college attendance and graduation, more crime and incarceration, especially in boys. Less success in the labor market and more likely to become a single parent themselves, especially in girls. See, here's the problem. When we don't do God's, when we don't do things God's way, reality proves the insanity of it. See, when you choose to say, look, I'm going to have an alternative lifestyle that's opposed to God, and I'm going to embrace it, reality says, yeah, you ain't having no babies and no children and no grandchildren, and you're going to die old and miserable and alone. Reality will prove the futility of a sinful lifestyle. How? When you have sex before marriage, you get pregnant. You either kill it or you end up in poverty. God is saying, people, listen, do it my way. We can't tell the world to do it that way when we don't do it that way. These statistics are exactly the same in the church. We're going to talk about the church in just a minute. This is not where we're going. It's where we are. We have fatherless men growing up who have no idea what it means to be a man. No reference point. Dads, you are the reference point to your children. Dads, do you realize if you go to heaven, they will. If you go to hell, you pave the way by your life for them to end up there. 80%, more than 80% of the time, dad, wherever you go, this isn't just about you. Wherever you go, they're going to follow you. 
They're going to reap the same results. Listen to this. Some contributing factors. 70% of those under the age of 35 think that having a child outside of marriage is perfectly okay. No problem. Morally, religiously, or otherwise. I'm not bashing you if you had. I'm not calling you names. I'm just telling you. God's way works. What you sow is what you reap. I can't change that. 78% think moral values in the United States are getting worse. Would you, would you all agree with that? 78% believe it's getting worse. Any of you believe it's getting better? Please don't raise your hand. I'll cast a devil out of you later. I'm I'm sorry. I'm just going to tell you, these statistics show, uh, let me just keep going. I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm pressed on time. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have done this at the beginning, but about two-thirds of American adults, 65%, agree strongly or somewhat, uh, or somewhat that every culture must determine what is, acceptably, what is acceptable morality-wise for its people. Well, you know, the culture really decides what's right or wrong. There's a name for that. It's called humanism. Well the, well, the culture should decide whether a baby has value or not. I'm asking you, please overlook my passion in some of these areas because there's an urgency I'm trying to convey. I'm not angry. I am kind of. <laughs> but guys, we got to wake up. Listen to this. Two-thirds of American adults believe that moral truth is either relative or circumstantial. Or haven't given it much, much thought. Truth has been eradicated. Now our moral dilemma is resulting in cultural chaos. Now we know the world's messed up, right? That's good. We know where the culture is. I think it's pretty obvious. Look around. But let's talk for just a minute about where the church is. All right? All right. The church is the primary problem in the culture because it's the only solution. Did you hear what I just said? I believe the church is a primary problem because the church is the primary solution. You say, why do you say that? Because the verse, verse that I wrote, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. If the world is walking in darkness, it's because we're not shining. We've taken the light and we've done something with it other than what God intended. God did not save you so that you could have your stinking best life now. God did not save you so you could have a nice car and have money and walk around perfectly healed and healthy. God saved you because he needed you to shine the reality of the kingdom of heaven in a broken, dark, war-ridden world. Guys, the government cannot fix this problem. Do you understand? No government. So CIA who's watching right now. The government is not the problem. They are a reflection of the problem. They cannot fix it. So where's the church? Are you ready? While only 19% of American Christians truly possess a biblical worldview, 51% of American adults think that they already have one. 19% of professing Christians' views line up with the Bible. 51% believe they already have one. Or, or, what does that mean? Hang on. 81% of professing Christians in America hold opinions about the world, which, which is the culture, morality, and truth that are opposed to the teachings of the Bible. Listen to this. It means that if most Christians wanted to stand up and take a stand, it would not be a biblical stand, and 51% of those would fight you over that fact. It means if the church wanted to stand up, it's so covered and draped in ignorance that it would be standing for the wrong thing. Let me give you some examples. This is Pew Research. You can look up any of these statistics. I got them off the internet. They must be true. <laughs> I got these from two reputable firms, Pew and Barna, primarily. 48% of Catholics believe abortion should be legal in any case. It's not biblical. 
can't kill a baby because it's an inconvenience or you think it's going to be poor. You can't kill anybody for that reason. You can't kill anybody because they're not, they don't look like what you think they should look like or they're not going to have the future you think they should have. You do not have autonomy over somebody else's anatomy. You can't just... 33%, listen to this, 33% of evangelical pro- Protestants believe abortion should be legal in all cases. Guys, that's, that's you. That's you hooping, hollering, Holy Ghost field, hand raising, worshiping, come to church at least once a week Christians. 33% believe that abortion for any reason is okay. It's not biblical. If your politics or your relationship don't line up with the Bible, you need to get new politics and new relationships. You understand? There ain't a place for Republicans and Democrats in the kingdom of God. We're either going to follow him or we're going to follow the world. You can't do both. Are you saying we shouldn't vote? I'm saying we should go way beyond voting. Anyway. Calm down. Let me just keep going. 60% of the frozen chosen, that's mainline Protestants, Believe abortion should be legal in every case. This is 60% of the church hold a unbiblical value on the issue of abortion. Hang on. Catholic, 57% of Catholics strongly favor same-sex marriage. Oh, hang on. 28% of evangelical Protestants strongly favor same-sex marriage. Guys, let me give you a newsflash. Same-sex marriage is absolutely opposed to the word of God. You say, well, I have a loved one. I know, and I have an answer. God's mercy and God's grace extends to those who are lost. And maybe you're struggling with that. There's help and there's hope. But if you're going to point your finger because you have a loved one who's, who's living in morality, and you're going to side with that as opposed to God, I'm begging you, please repent. Please repent. If you put any relationship, mother, father, children, daughter, anybody before God, you're not worthy of God. That's Christ's words, not mine. I understand it's difficult. But I'm not going to dance around this. You know what it is? It's sin. It's wrong. It's like anything else. We repent of it. 57% of Catholics, 28% of evangelical Protestants, 28, more than one quarter of born again people believe that it's okay or strongly favor it. 57% of mainline Protestants, that's the frozen chosen, strongly favor. 57%. Same-sex marriage. I'm not picking on that. I don't see that as special. They would say the same things about fornication. They would say the same thing about adultery. Listen, any form of sex outside of one original man and one original woman is wrong. Repent. Make that level playing ground. Everybody clear there. You say, I don't like it. I don't care. You're, You're arguing with God. You're not arguing with me. I didn't make the rules. I didn't make up the truth. I didn't make reality. But I tell you what. Reality will prove every lie and every compromise to be what it is, deadly. Barna says, listen to this, 28% believe that everyone is basically praying to the same God. More than 60% of born-again Christians between the ages of 18 and 39, that's most of the people in this room, believe that Jesus, Buddha, and Muhammad are all equal in regards to paths of salvation. Do you know what that's called? It's called New Age. It's called new spirituality. See, because when you don't hold a biblical worldview, you hold another worldview. What's another worldview that we hold in the church other than the Bible? How about this one? 13% believe that a person's life is valuable only if if society sees it as valuable. You know what that's called? It's called secular humanism. How about this one? How about this one? 23% of practicing Christians strongly agree that what is morally right or wrong depends on what an individual believes. You know what that's called? That's postmodernism. Your truth, my truth, it's okay for you, but it's not okay with me. I don't care if you think it's okay with you or not. I have an obligation as salt and light in this world to tell you that it's wrong, and if you don't repent, you're going to a devil's hell. You say, well, Pastor Tony, that sounds like turn and burn. Yeah, it sounded like that in Noah's day, too. Yeah, it sounded like that in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, too. You know, it sounds like that today in America, too. It sounded like that when John the Baptist came to the church and said, you need to repent, too. The question is, we're all on the wall. Are we saying what our predecessors have said, or are we taking a road of ease and comfort that will cost us nothing? 
You may say, well, Pastor Tony, I'm not going to make an issue out of these things. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to sit here on the bleachers and let y'all do the work. There will be no bleachers very, very soon. You will choose. The culture will make you choose. The culture will make your thoughts on these things illegal. (laughs) You say, that's not going to happen. Oh, wait till I share the rest of these statistics. 14% of practicing Christians strongly agree that the government rather than individuals should control as much of the resources as necessary to ensure that everybody gets a fair share. You know what that's called? Marxism. Look, the government wants it so we can control it. Sorry, government, if you're listening, I love you. I pray that godly men are running you so that you can, you can do godly stuff with the stuff that you take from people. <laughs> Don't pay your taxes. You'll find out. They'll take your taxes at the point of a gun or put your butt in jail. I'm just telling you. It might seem all innocuous until you stand in opposition to it. I am pro-government. Government is ordained by God, and we should always honor and pray for those in leadership. I want to make that very, very clear. What I'm talking about rebelling against has nothing to do with government, has nothing to do with people. We're going to get into that in just a few minutes. We're looking at the byproducts, and we're looking at the condition of the church. How about this one? 50% of U.S. Christians say that casual sex between consenting adults is sometimes or always acceptable. This is the church. 50% of Christians feel their spiritual life is entirely private. That means they have absolutely no obligation to share the gospel with anybody. 58% of the church. Hang on. 28% of Christians. 28% of Christians are actively involved in discipleship. Now think about this. 28% of the 100 professing Christians are actively involved in discipleship. When I say discipleship, it means that they are, they are pouring into somebody and being poured into by somebody. 28% of the church is doing what the Bible says. You're called to make disciples. You understand that. If you're not making disciples, you're not a disciple. So where are we headed? I'll tell you where we're headed. We're headed for more of what we've been experiencing. We have seen more change in the last five years than we've seen in the last 15. Correct? Anybody who's been sober and woke for the last 15 years, you know that. So let me tell you what's going to happen. If we see more change in the last five years than we saw in the previous 15 years, I can promise you this. In the next two years, you will see more change than you've seen in the last five years. It's the law of exponential return. I'm telling you. Here's what we're headed for. We're headed for increased censorship and cultural marginalization. It's already illegal to teach opposing views on evolution in our public schools. The toleration of it, we can't teach it, it won't even be tolerated by the students moving forward. How about this? Uh, You are already subject to be banned for hate speech if you share biblical views on sexual immorality or abortion or on social media platforms or anywhere else, no matter how gently or godly you present it, it's gonna get worse a lot quicker. You guys in the military, when that man shows up in that skirt, you even look at him funny, you're going to be out of your job. Somebody having a psychosis is one thing. Me being forced to validate that psychosis is another. We can't do it. I am not going to play the game. I'm not going to get into this political correct boat at the cost of the lives of the people who are at stake and being deluded thinking this is normal. This is not normal. It's not healthy. It doesn't work in reality. And I won't sit around and be forced to say that it is. Guys, you better know this because the second you do that or the second you don't fall in step, the moment you decide to exalt your God above your job or or your relationship or whatever, you're going to possibly get canceled. It may come with a price tag, but listen to me. Your comfort is the greatest obstacle to your calling. You're already subject to be banned again for hate speech if you share anything concerning sexual immorality of any way, any any sort. We see it all over. How about this? Your business and your career is and will increasingly be jeopardized if you do not tow the agenda of the culture politically, morally, and philosophically. How about this one? Greater opposition and persecution. Pastor Tony, we don't have that in America. The lack of response from the public as well as the federal law enforcement to crimes committed against crisis pregnancy centers is absolute empirical proof 
that persecution against Christian groups is tolerated, if not acceptable, in this nation now. 40, a clin 40 clinics attacked, burned, or destroyed, zero arrests. During that time, one Planned Parenthood arrests within five days. Guys, you think it's okay. I'm just telling you. The news didn't scream. People weren't protesting in the streets. The government is not intervening. Persecution against those who stand with God is culturally acceptable to some degree, and that is empirical truth. You better see where we're at right now. You better see where we're going. Listen to this. A growing portion of our country is increasingly hostile towards Christianity. 70% increase in religious freedom violations just in the last three years. Judge Alito said this, the problem that looms is not just indifference to religion. It's not just ignorance about religion. He said at a 2022 Notre Dame Religious Liberty Summit in Rome, there's also growing hostility to religion or at least the traditional religious beliefs that are contrary to new moral code that is ascended in some sectors. There's a lot more statistics that are incredibly alarming. The number of churches that have been attacked since the, since the Dobbs case. Hundreds and hundreds of churches. So if you don't think for a minute there's an association between pro-life and Christianity, you're out of your mind. The devil knows it. How about this one? I believe that there will be greater opportunity. The increased censorship and cultural marginalization along with greater opposition and persecution. That's, that's, that's fine. That's what's going to happen. But this creates greater opportunity for the church to shine. Greater opportunity to reveal itself different from the world. In direct opposition to the world and its ways. Guys, it's easy to shine bright when the world is really, really dark. And that's exactly what we're told is going to happen. It says in the last days, perilous times will come. It says that there's some rough stuff that's going to come up on the church. And most people in the church are going to fall away. It's called the great falling away. Most of the people in the church are not going to recognize where we are, much less make the adjustments necessary to stand when opposition reaches its peak. We've seen that in every country throughout history. Guys, there's nowhere to run. There's not another continent to which to, to flee. Guys, it's not a matter. <laughs> the orcs <laughs> are among us. <laughs> the orcs are upon us. They're not at the gates. The gates have been broken down. But greater opportunity to be seen as the hope when everything else seems hopeless. And I'm not saying and sharing these things that you would be hopeless because we're not. So let's define something very, very carefully and very, very quickly here. Who is the enemy? Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against Republicans and Democrats. It's not against your neighbors, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark age, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Guys, you understand that the people who are blinded and who are perpetuating these atrocities against God are your brothers and your sisters made in the image of God, blinded to the truth and hostile towards reality, even by the, the behavior of their lives. But guess what? We're called to reach them because daddy loves them. Just like you. If you had a child and that child was lost and that child was doing all kinds of dumb stuff, you would love that child and you would be praying for that child and you'd do everything you could to rescue that child from that situation. You wouldn't give up on them. Well, God has said the same to us. These are our brothers and our sisters and the God of this world has blinded their eyes. They've believed lies, and those lives are resulting in, in destruction in their, in their real lives and in reality. This is who we're called to. But so often we're, we're angry and hateful towards people. Guys, these people are the object of God's affection. You know, when we pray and we say, God, what are we to do? The first thing we need to do is, go, God, send us the lost. 
God, send revival. God, have mercy and send salvation. The, the rain is coming. The ark is built in the person of Jesus Christ. We need to be inviting them. We need to be casting down these foolish thoughts and imaginations that are contrary to the word of God. We need our swords of truth to be sharpened so that we can break the shackles of tyranny that the enemies placed on them. But our swords are dull if we even have them. We're ignorant I'm not being ugly, please. I'm, I'm not angry. I'm just saying, guys, we're past. We're past time. Guys, we fight with the enemy, but we fight for humanity. And this is not a new enemy. He's, he's not defeated by conventional methods, but he is beatable. This is a winnable war that we're in. He, will, he said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Here's a question. Are we sharing the truth freely that perpetuates the freedom that the world needs? Guys, if you're not doing it, if you're not praying, if you're not seeking God, if you don't know your word, if you're not sharing truth, there's nobody else. There's nobody else. I pray that there's churches around America who have people standing in the pulpits who are saying the same thing to their congregation that I'm saying to you, but you need to understand they're feeling the same things you are feeling, and that tension of do I do something or do I not do something or how can I do something is right there in them just like it's in you. And if they choose to do nothing, we'll see no change. Can you imagine how Lot felt when he realized there's nobody else in this city there's nobody coming with me. Guys, this world is a world and its ways are ways of destruction. It is set on destruction. He said, come out from among them and be separate. You are the only invitation people will ever see to come onto the ark of safety, which is Jesus Christ. If we don't do it, it doesn't happen. This entire series is dedicated to answering the questions on what we're supposed to do on an individual and on a corporate level. The world needs help and the world needs hope. And Jesus brings both. This is a winnable war. I said it earlier, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. You are that standard. You're that image glory bearer of God that brings truth and light to everybody who's bound in darkness. I'm going to read this one more time. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. How well are you shining? I don't know that anyone in history ever operated again with a greater sense of urgency than John the Baptist. He had a very simple but very profound message. It was repent. Guys, we need to repent. We need to stop preaching a repentless salvation. He said, believe and repent and be baptized. Guys, we've got to quit siding with the world and, and give all of our allegiance to God. I think one of the greatest accusations is that we have carried the Lord's name in vain. Again, that we said we are of Christ, yet we lived in a way contrary to Christ. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about the compromise, either in commission or omission. Guys, until we realize the desperation of the hour and the urgency of the moment, we're going to stay in a place of complacency, which only leads to apathy. We're going to get more and more of the same if we don't do something different. What is the Spirit of God saying to you? What are you willing to give and sacrifice? What comfort are you willing to let go of? What priority are you willing to change? You and I are God's plan. The way we live, the truth we carry, the honor we display, the words we speak, the sacrifices we make, the urgency with which we act or we don't act. These are all the difference makers between a life that is one of light and one that's not. Are you light and salt in our culture? Or are you a contributor to its delinquency?
See, guys, the Bible says that judgment begins in the house of God. The world doesn't stand a chance. I'm talking to you because I love you. You're my brothers and my sisters. We are the army of God in the earth, and we don't carry guns and bullets and wear bulletproof vests, but we carry the power, the spiritual power of the Word of God to combat the foolishness that has brought our nation into captivity. We are the only hope. The church is the only hope for this world. Wednesday night, we're going to be showing something that's going to combat some of the foolishness. The Bible says that His Word is powerful and mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. People's thinking has got to change. We're transformed by the renewing of our minds. Our minds need to be changed. We need to be educated. We need to understand. We need to be equipped. It's what my heart is to equip you to do battle and to do war effectively, to be able to stand strong because when all of this stuff really ramps up to the next level, and it is and it will, if you can't run with the foot soldiers, what do you think is going to happen when the tanks come? Because we've got to be ready and we've got to be prepared. Wednesday night, we're going to be showing a documentary, and we don't normally do this. We're going to show two. One this coming Wednesday night. You can watch it online, but we don't have the right, so it can't stay online. But we're going to be talking about the live evolution versus God and how that theory has, has created nihilism and stripped us of hope and help in our culture. We're going to talk about and expose that, and then we're going to show another documentary on Made in His Image, how the, the homosexual and LGBTQ agenda has swept America and, and the value that we have as a result of being made in the image of God. You say, well, I don't need that. Well, your children do because they're going to school being indoctrinated with it tomorrow. It's immorality. It's in direct opposition of God. You say, well, Pastor Tony, are you, are you wanting unbelievers to be forced into a, pl- a place? No, I'm just saying we need, we need moral restraint. Moral restraint. You understand that freedom is only for those who are good men. Wicked men cannot have freedom. They cause a degree of destruction and disorder. That's why we have laws. Laws are for lawbreakers. God's law is good. It helps us survive. It helps the culture to thrive. When we break that and we go a different way, there are ramifications that are undeniable. Undeniable. So if you have school-aged children or loved ones, please check that out Wednesday night at, at 7 o'clock. Stand if you're able. Look, I know there's a lot of statistics and a lot of stuff. This is a winnable war, but it begins when we turn and we respond and we repent. John the Baptist had an urgency like none I've seen. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Where you go, the kingdom of God follows. Take the light, take the salt, dispel the lie, stand for truth no matter what the cost. You say, well, Pastor Tony, I'm scared. Yeah, me too. But that doesn't mean we stop. The judgment begins right here, guys. If you've been living a life that is besmirching the name of Jesus, if you've been carrying the name of Jesus in a way that makes him look bad, that's called carrying the Lord, using the Lord's name in vain. That's not saying OMG or GD. Carrying the Lord's name in vain, again, is, is saying I'm a believer, I'm a follower, and not forsaking sin. Creating an image of God where, where, a, where he's not what he says he is pray with me Father this world needs help this world needs hope you have said that we are the hope we are the light of this world we're the salt I'm asking you God those who are willing I'm asking you God to give us a spirit of sobriety God not that we're angry or mad at people God but we are clear and understanding that we have a real enemy who has destroyed the culture here in America and is seeking to destroy the church. Father, I'm asking you for revival. I'm asking you, God, for a revival of love and an outpouring of your spirit, God, in our lives. Father, I'm asking you to grant us repentance. God, I ask you to forgive me for anything in my life, God, that has not represented you well. Any hidden motives or or selfish ambition, Father God, where I've exalted my comfort above your call, God, forgive me. God, give us creative and innovative ways, God, to to take your gospel to this world like never before, to be salt and light like never before. In Jesus' name.
If you need prayer, there are going to be people up here at the front. I want to say this. The series is going to be really practical moving forward. Week three, we're going to launch some brand new outreach initiatives, and we're going to put some tools in your hand, and we're going to make it not just plausible. (laughs) We're going to make it possible for you to go out and be salt and light like never before. Pray that we'll have wisdom and and we'll be able to execute this with unity and, and, and with effectiveness. Amen. Again, if you need prayer, please come down the front. There'll be people here to pray with you. God bless you.